Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I'm the Carb Addiction Doc. And the last few weeks, there's been something just blowing up on the internet and blowing up on the news media. And it's because of one particular thing that's happened. There's a company, I think there's two companies that are in the news right now. One of them called Upside Foods. And Upside Foods has been around for about a decade, 15 years, but they've just applied to the FDA to have their lab-grown meat certified as safe for human consumption. And in fact, at the, at the big climate uh, conference that was just held in, um, uh, in Egypt uh, this past week, and this is when we're taping this, uh, they actually served some of the lab-grown meat as some sort of an answer to the world's uh, problems with in growing enough protein and some of the carbon that cows are supposed to fart out, ignoring completely the cows on the road. For every cow, there's, for every car, 10 cows can produce less methane. But anyway, lab-grown meat has become this big new topic that we're all aware of. And there are multiple companies. I've got and there's so many companies growing this. And you've got Upside Foods, which is growing chicken, uh, Finless Foods, which I really like, which is growing fish and seafood. There are a few of the fish and seafood. Um, there's Blue Nalu, Balotelic. Uh, there's so many different companies on the market that most of us were oblivious to because they're all functioning in kind of this little secrecy, developing their product. So where does all of this come from? Well, one of the things that I did in the lab way back and that we've done for the last 20 or 30 years is to try to grow cells and trigger those cells to become new organs. So in organ replacement, in organ transplant, which is kind of what my PhD and my master's thesis were on, liver transplantation, we're trying to grow new organs so we don't have to harvest them from dead or dying human beings. And if you can grow corneas, if you can grow muscles, if you can grow tissue on some platform of engineering, wouldn't that be really cool? And I think we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Xenografts, which means the, the graft comes from another animal and we can transport it. So you can grow, uh, have uh, established, grow pigs, for example, that have a human biome to them. Not a biome, but a human biology. We can harvest hearts grown in pigs, which is going to save the donor pool and save a lot of lives. Kidneys, hearts, eyes, uh, lungs, organs. Um, that's really what we're looking for. And there's a big science, and I've been engaged in that and tracking that since I was in the lab because it was popular. Xenografts were popular way back. However, out of that methodology, out of that cell culture technology, very smartly, we said, okay, why can't we then grow food? Why can't we grow meat in a culture lab? And absolutely, we can do that. We've got. We've been working for decades now on the right formulas, the nutrients that these that these cells need, and we have done a superb job of taking a little biopsy from a chicken, a little biopsy from a cow or a pig or a fish, and growing that meat, that muscle, that muscle cell in culture. We've grown muscles in culture from the 1920s. We've grown them for in vitro experiments. We've done tons of experiments in muscle culture. We've grown heart muscle. We've grown diaphragm muscle. We've grown skeletal muscle of various animals so that we could do experiments on them. And a lot of the research that we've done, the physiologic research, comes from that. So now we're growing these muscle cells in huge vats, in huge tanks in the laboratory. And we've become very successful at doing that. And I love that. Basically, what the... Uh, meat, the lab-grown meat culture is, which is primarily these muscle cells, it's basically a very, very sophisticated protein drink. It's a very sophisticated protein drink. And yes, there are benefits, but there are liabilities. So the benefit over a protein shake, so you can buy any protein shake out there. The problem with the protein shakes is not what's in them. The problem is what's not in them. So if you look at, at protein, at amino acids, which is really what we're talking about, there's 21 amino acids. And as you eat that protein, um, all of those, those proteins, whether they're amino acids or chains of protein, the gut breaks them down, turns them into the individual amino acids. They go to the liver and the liver, under the influence of insulin, reformats those amino acids into proteins, hormones, enzymes, and proteins that are helpful for the human body. And then the excess gets turned to sugar, um, gets turned to other forms of amino acids that then get turned to sugar or ketones. You've got some that form ketones, some that form sugar. The majority of them become sugar. So any excess protein that we consume becomes sugar. And the problem with the protein shakes, as I said, is not what's in them. 
but there are a few amino acids that are very difficult to get into solution. And if all the 21 amino acids are need to make healthy human protein, if you are missing a few of those amino acids, or in the right concentration, the liver can't do that. So therefore, the liver turns all of that protein into sugar. So basically, when you're drinking a protein shake and somebody on TV or on the internet says, oh, this is so good, it builds your muscle, that is absolute bullshit. That is wrong. It is basically a calorie-laden sugar drink that eventually will either get used as sugar or used as fat, depending on your athleticism, depending on your level of insulin resistance. But they are not, protein shakes are not of benefit to the majority of people as protein. They're basically calorie drinks, they're sugar drinks. The value of the lab-grown meat is that by definition, the meat, these cells, have already pre-programmed themselves to produce healthy protein from all 21 amino acids. So these are lean protein, comprehensive lean protein in the right equation, cells. So yes, this is an upgrade from protein drinks. And to have a slab of chicken or a slab of fish that is made in a laboratory is going to be very beneficial as a supplement, not as a replacement. And here's the the, the place where the misguided thinking of these labs comes in. When we're eating meat, when we're eating animal products, and this is what's so important about animal products, is there are two very, very important classes of nutrients that are part of animal products that we eat, real animals, and that the lab-grown meat just is deficient and just doesn't have enough, partly because of the psychology and the misguided psychology of the scientists doing this, and part of it is because of the structure of the animals. The first thing, the most glaringly obvious thing that is missing and will always be missing because of the misguided thought process of these scientists is fat. Because they've all grown up in an era of fat demonization, of lipophobia. And the most valuable thing in a ketogenic diet of the way we eat is we tolerate and we encourage people to eat fat. The 80-20 that we eat is 80% of calories from fat and 20% from protein when you're eating animals. But these labs are growing meat deficient in fat. And that fat is so essential, so essential to the healthy utilization of protein, of amino acids for protein. Otherwise, that lean protein is just becoming, for the most part, a little bit more going to regular protein, but for the most part, lean protein just becomes sugar. It's a source of calories. So the absence of fat is a glaring, glaring mistake of all of these uh, um, lab-grown meats. And can they grow fat? Of course they can grow fat. Of course they can make the fat, particularly the fish product ones. But they're choosing not to because they're afraid of fat. And they think it's going to harm their sales. They're trying to improve the quality of meat for human beings. Add fat. The second big class of Uh, nutrients that are missing are the micronutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the trace elements. Yes, there's going to be a certain amount in there because all these cells need those to grow normally. Every cell, every cell, every mammalian cell needs those, including the chicken and the the beef and the fish that's lab-grown. But the concentration is not going to be adequate because there's no bone mineralization, there's no tendons, there's no ligaments, there's no liver, there's no organs here. There's no whole animal like an egg or an oyster or a sardine. We're not getting in all of those. So what these guys have done, and I think very smartly, is they've said, okay, we're going to have this meat, but not in isolation. We're going to have the meat with certain vegetables. And the vegetables that their dietitians are are serving with this meat are going to supplement some of those nutrients. Some of those nutrients. But they're not giving us the huge bang for buck of the nutrients that we get from these other things. So if you're going to eat lab-grown meat, eat it with an egg, eat it with a can of oysters, eat it with some bacon, eat it with other animal products or vegetables that give you the full micro micronutrient uh, range of foods, the vin- minerals, the vitamins, the trace elements that we need in the right balance as human beings to sustain our full global nutrition. And I think they're going to accomplish that by pairing it with some of the vegetables. However, however, just like with vegans 
And yes, this is an anti-vegan statement because veganism is not a diet, it's a disease. It's a disease. Veganism causes disease unless you supplement massively. Okay? So the problem there is the lack of fat. And the issue here is not that they can't do it as scientists. They've chosen not to because their belief is erroneous that fat is bad for us. So the lab-grown meat has a huge potential. And I would love, I would just love, love, love one of these lab-grown meats to say we need fat. We need fat. Or how do we serve this lab-grown meat between two slices of cheese or with some egg or with some oysters or with some liver? How do we make that together with our lab-grown meat so that the meat is a portion of the purpose of what we're doing? So a huge, massive, beneficial stride in science. I'd much rather grow some lab, eat some lab-grown meat than have a protein shake. But I'll have my lab-grown meat with some pork belly, with some bacon, with some cheese, with some eggs, with some liver. And maybe with some vegetables if you choose to. But keep an eye on the space, folks. Keep an eye on the space. And I wish there was a proactive... Well, here's the problem with it. If they did put fat with their meat, <laughs> this is what's so... <sighs> I was going to use the F word here because it's applicable, but I'm not going to. You can insert that if you choose to. Here's what's so screwed up about this entire thinking. If they added fat in the right proportion that we do in our ketogenic diets, they added the right proportion of fat, the FDA would not give them approval. The FDA would not give them approval for this meat. How screwed up is that? How screwed up is that? That is the conundrum. That is how screwed up we currently are. If they produced healthy meat with healthy fat, it would not get approval for human consumption because it would make people's cholesterol too high. <laughs> I am the carb addiction doc. If I've made you think, I've just blown my own brain. Yeah, my brain's mostly fat. I am the Carbon addiction Doc. If I've made you think, hit the like button, leave comments down below, but watch this space. And I'd love someone in this lab-grown meat to have the integrity to grow it the way it occurs in animals. Not the way we would have it, by cutting the fat out. Leave a comment, hit the like button, subscribe, there's more to come. But watch this space.